Evening. Open your Bibles to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11 for our first passage for the evening. Numbers chapter 11. I, I tell you, I am super excited about the snow coming this evening, it, whether it comes or not. I always get excited about potential snow, even if it's just a just pretty to watch falling down from the sky. Odds are I'll be sleeping when it happens, so I'm not sure why I'm so excited about it. Uh, at first, when they first started talking about it on a Sunday night, I thought, if I preach long enough, I get to preach till daybreak, and uh, then it's not going to accumulate, so that kind of smashed that hope. So anyway, Numbers chapter 11, go ahead and open there. Starting in verse 4, the riffraff among them had a strong craving for other food. The Israelites wept again and said, Who will feed us meat? We remember the free fish we ate in Egypt, along with the cucumbers, melon, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There's nothing to look at but this manna. How ridiculous is this? I tell you, every time I read this, I, I, I just marvel at the revisionist history that exists in their mind. They were slaves in Egypt. I don't believe they were eating at banquet tables every night. They were probably barely eating from their exhaustion. And yet, the way they remember it now, a little bit after coming out of Egypt, is that they got to feast on all of these wonderful, free, fresh foods. What, what, a, what a wonderful thing to have. And we all know there's no way in the world that's what they enjoyed on a regular basis. Yet we do that. Over the Christmas holidays, we, we tend to watch a lot of Christmas movies. And one of my favorite to watch uh, ever since it came out has been Polar Express. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen it. it it's a fantastic movie, fantastic storytelling. It, it's, it's just a really fun movie. But one of the reasons I love it is because there is an incredible spiritual application to that movie. It is a movie based entirely on the principle of believing is seeing. You've got a boy at the beginning of the movie who's not sure what he believes anymore regarding good old jolly St. Nick, and he's researching things and looking up articles and looking up in the encyclopedia whether, you know, what does it say about the North Pole and, and those types of things. And, of course, this train shows up in the middle of the night and wakes him up, and he jumps on board and they have this adventurous ride all the way to the North Pole, and at the North Pole, he sees the elves, he meets St. Nick, uh, and, and he is able to finally believe. But what I love about the movie is the scene where the, where the bell has come off the sleigh and bounced across the ground and landed right in front of the boy's feet. And he picks it up, and he, he can't hear the bells, which I can relate to because I still can't hear them, and not because of belief or not. I just can't hear that sound. But he, he, he's trying to ring this thing in his ear, and he can't, he can't hear the jingle of the bells, and so he, he closes his eyes, and he says, I believe, I believe, I believe, and all of a sudden he can hear the bell again. In a world that tries to convince us that there's nothing worth believing unless you can prove it with your own two eyes, the message that there are things worth believing, even if you can't see them, is a good message. And in that case, it's talking about uh, the, the joy of, of Christmas, and there's an application there for, for you and me. Because I, I think we struggle with that concept. We struggle with the idea that believing is seeing. That's, that's not what I want. Where am I going here? Am I going backwards? I am going backwards. That's not helpful at all. Let me get the right direction here, and we'll get to that. Believing is seeing. That, that's what we want to see. You had to see it to believe it, right? Like, 
Adam didn't do a PowerPoint tonight. How many of you had that? No, okay. All right, so we, we've got a, that, that concept of believing is seeing. It's, it, it's a wonderful concept, and it's something that we need to ourselves come to grips with. Uh, the truth is, uh, there's, there's a great difficulty that comes with faith in our world because it is hard to believe in the unseen. It is hard to say that while I can't put my hands on it and I can't rest my eyes on it, I still believe it anyway because there is so much around us that we can see that is easy to believe in, easy to trust in, and so it's easy to explain away what's unseen. I think that's one of the problems the Israelites were having here in Numbers chapter 11 and in the many other stories where they struggled to believe. They were promised an unseen result. If you will follow Moses, you will get the promise that God has given to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God will deliver you to this land that flows with milk and honey. It's a land that flows with abundance. It's a land that flows with good things that you cannot have on your own. But as they traveled and they remembered the things they did have and possibly even falsely remembered things that they didn't have, it was easier to put their trust in what they had than put their trust into what they could have. It was easy to believe in what they had seen and touched with their hand than it was to believe in what they had not yet seen. We, we fall into the same trap. It's easy to put our faith in the world now than it is to put our faith in what's still to come. You know, I, I look at the early Christian and the struggles that they went through and the persecution that they endured, I look at the fact that they had to hold strong to their belief and to their Savior, even facing persecution, facing arrest, facing uh, being thrown in the, in the court, in the jail, and then maybe even into the Colosseum. They, they, were, they were told, you can recant, you can get rid of this Jesus and these promises of something else, and have it better now. And how many of them were willing to trust in the unseen instead of the seen? It's hard to trust in what we've not experienced, isn't it? Anybody here ever, ever, ever been to heaven yet? No? Anybody here been to something like heaven yet? In, any? Anyone? No. I mean, the, the truth is, the whole concept of heaven is a foreign concept to us because the idea of something that amazing is really hard for us to wrap our brain around. But You know, I can trust in what I know today. I can trust in good experiences I've had in my life now. I, it's easy to trust and, and know that if I just had more money I could have more things that would make me happy. That's the way a lot of the world goes. I, I can trust in, uh, I, can, I can seek out certain pleasures of life, even though it's not what God would want me to do. I know it ends in pleasure, so I can pursue those things, and I know those things are real. But I'm trading all of that for something I, I really just don't even have a way to wrap my brain around what I'm trading it for. That's hard. It's hard to do that. It's hard to hold on to the intangible when we are surrounded by so much that is experienceable. Is that a word? That it, it's hard. It, it's hard to say I would prefer to have this unseen thing that is not only something I've never experienced, but it's something I never can experience on this earth because it is so otherworldly, it is beyond my comprehension. It's a whole lot easier to hold on to the world. Again, I, I think that's the struggle that the Israelites had. 
we look at them and we shame them and we talk down to them because they weren't willing to trust in God. But that's difficult when you've never seen the end. So what do we do? Well, the best thing I have to give to you is that we need to hold on to those who have held on before. I, I kind of picture it like this. Um, I don't recommend these places, but in Florida, at all of the theme parks, they have haunted uh, mansion-type things in, in all of the parks. So uh, they'll have, you know, during the, the Halloween season, the month of October, they will open up in the evening, and they will, they will have constructed all of these different horror houses and things like that. And I tell you, they're generally not great places to go hang out. But I've been... And what has always cracked me up is whenever I see a group of people that are going through it, and, and, and there's one guy in the front, he's the leader, or a girl in the front who's the leader, and then you got about four people behind them, and all they're doing is they're holding on to the shirt of the person in front of them, and they're going through like this. And they're just being drugged through the hallway of this haunted house having this experience. And then what cracks me up is they get to the other side and they're like, I did it! And I'm like, no, you did it. You kept your eyes closed. But that's kind of what we need to do tonight. Because we've got some people who have gone on before us who have been the leader, who have walked the path already. They know what's there. And if we'll just grab onto their shirt tails and follow along, we'll get there. That, that's what it takes. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. That, that's where I want to spend the bulk of our time tonight, Hebrews chapter 11. Because here we, we've got what we read this morning in chapter 12, a, a great, a large cloud of witnesses. People who have done it already. People who have already gone before us. Who already, they believed. And that caused them to see the end result. Which then allowed them to actually see the thing. Uh, here's, here's what I mean. Let, let's kind of go down the list here uh, for just a second. So first of all, we've got verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen is made from things that are not visible. So at, right from the beginning, really verse 1, where it talked about faith is the evidence of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Verse 3, what is what things made from things that are not visible. This idea of we are blind. That, that's, that's the setting here for Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be talking about seeing the unseen things, or may I, may I reword this, believing is seeing. That's what we're dealing with here in Hebrews chapter 11. We've got people who have gone before us who believe in a creator. So we can believe in a creator. That's important. That's kind of the beginning here. You know, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Uh, Without faith it's impossible to please God, but he who believes must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So the beginning is believing he is. He is the creator. He is the Lord. He is God. He is worth following. He is worth pursuing. He is worth trusting. And he is worth acting and obeying. Okay? So let's... Let's kind of go down the list here. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. So here, Abel is our forerunner when it comes to worshiping the unseen. It's interesting to me, and you go back to, to Genesis chapter 4 where you've got the story of Cain and Abel and they're offering their sacrifices. And we assume that there's some sort of, of, of miraculous revelation going on there, but what's interesting is we're never actually told that. We know God has a conversation with Cain, 
when Cain is allowing sin to crouch at the door, where does God ever speak to Abel? You don't read of it. All we know about Abel is that he worshipped by faith. That's what we know. We have no record of him having a greater revelation of God than what we have. And if anything, our evidence is that he had less because all he had was a, a, a world that was in a mess and, and he had no scriptures on which to build his, his faith. He had the word of his dad. And, but he worshipped by faith. That means he took from his flock the very best animal he had and he took that animal and slaughtered it from human eyes senselessly and pointlessly. He didn't save anything. He didn't uh, uh, take the hide and do anything with it. He just allowed this, this animal he had put his time and energy into to raising up and he slaughtered it for the benefit of a God he could not see. He worships the unseen. Verse 5 and 6. By faith Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Now, without faith it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You know, what, what astonishes me about Enoch is that he was a man who dared to live differently. Do you remember the world in which Enoch was living? How it's described in Genesis where every intent of the heart was on evil? That, that the world was just a, a mess of immorality and sin? That the people had deserted God, they had deserted not just the worship of God, but any adherence to God's laws whatsoever, all they wanted was sin and immorality. But Enoch lived differently. He was willing to defy his culture and defy the people around him and defy the way, their way of living and reject the pleasures that they had that are, that are given by sin and be willing to pursue a God that, again, we don't know that he had any sort of miraculous revelation from that God, any sort of direct interaction. We really don't know. All we know is that Enoch obeyed even in the face of a culture that didn't. He was willing to believe until he saw the promise given. The next one, verse 7. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You know what astonishes me about Noah is that he was willing to trust in something that had never been seen. Now, I don't know that that means, as some have taught traditionally, that rain had never fallen on the earth. I, I don't know that that's true. People base that off of the description in Genesis 2 of what I think is describing the Garden of Eden particularly. But you've got what we know he had never seen was destruction by rainfall, especially on that scale. There was no indication that the world was going to to go into failure mode the way that it did on that occasion. But when God said this is what was going to happen, he believed it. And not only did he believe it, he believed it to the point of spending what, if I'm understanding correctly, the next century of his life building a large wooden box out in the middle of a field somewhere so that it could, and covering it with pitch inside and out and building you know, to the specifications that God gave. I mean, you don't do that quietly and privately. Like he did this out in public sight. Everybody would have known crazy old Noah 
and him building his massive box out there, and, and he would have been out there telling them about the impending doom that God had promised, because we know he was also called a preacher of righteousness, and, and they weren't willing to listen to that. They were rejecting him. I, I am sure he was ridiculed and made fun of and despised, and, and the people didn't want to have anything to do with him, yet he went out there and he faithfully built this box based on a threat that nobody had ever seen. He believed until he saw. Next one. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, set out for a place that, was going, that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out, uh, even though he did not know where he was going. Having faith to go to the unknown. That's hard. I mean, it's one thing to be told, hey, I want you to get up, pack up, and go to this place you've never been. That's one thing. I mean, if we knew that the, the name of the town, we could go ask all of our neighbors, has anybody ever been to this place? What's it like? We do that, don't we? Uh, now we tend to do that more on social media than we do by actually talking to people, but we'll hey, I'm taking a trip to such and such place. Anybody ever been? What should I expect? And we'll, we'll gather up information and we'll, we'll research about where the best restaurants are and we'll make sure that we know exactly what we're walking into and uh, anybody got any tips and tricks or you know, anything we don't want to miss. And like we'll, we'll like have this itinerary put together of exactly what to expect. Abraham couldn't do that. He didn't even know where he was going. God said, get up and go to this place I will show you. And he got up and he went. I, I'm going to be honest. We struggle to go even when we know where it is. We struggle to, to get up and go even when we've been told all these great things about where we're going to end up. I mean, we, we, we have maybe not a geography of where our end place is, but we've got great descriptions of it. We, we know exactly, at least in some ways, what to expect when we get there. Abraham had nothing, but he went because he was willing to believe until he saw Next verse here. By faith he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. Oh. I, I, again, we, we don't know a lot about Abraham's life before he took this trip. But the implication I read in this verse is that he went from brick-and-mortar homes, places of ease and comfort, to go live in tents. I don't know about you, but I hate camping. Why anybody would choose to go sleep on the ground for no reason, that, that's, it's beyond me. If I'm with the right people, I can enjoy it. I, I, I don't mind setting up a tent in the yard and going out there with the boys and my girls and, and us, us playing in the tent and enjoying a, a night together. I don't know that I could dedicate the next 50 years of my life to it. But that's what Abram does. He, he gets up and he goes. And he leaves the comforts of home, the comforts of family, he leaves the, what, what was probably sure to be a great inheritance. We don't know much about his family, but uh, I mean, for him to set out with what he set out with and grow and be as industrious as he is and blessed by God and all those things that he had, uh, it, I mean, it, he essentially had to start over, go to a land he didn't know. We don't know what he did before. Four, I don't think, we know what he did before he set out, but possibly had to learn a new career, had to learn to trust that God would take care of his every need. He gave up ease 
for obedience. Next verse here says in verse 10, For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now here, here's the next piece of Abraham's story that I find absolutely amazing. We know that as he went from his home to this promised land, where he went to dwell in tents for the rest of his life, he had a family, he had to trust in God that God would provide him an heir. That was a long process of trusting in God. Even in all of that, he became a very wealthy, blessed man. Uh, He was so wealthy that he had his own personal army. That's impressive. I don't know of anybody in America that wealthy. I mean, it, he was a man who was willing to, uh, he had so much, so much agriculture, so many flocks that he and Lot had to separate. Uh, he, he was just, he was a man of great prominence. Here's what I find amazing about all that. As great as life became on earth, he never stopped longing for the fulfillment of God's promise. Abram never settled in. Abram never got comfortable. Abram never said, okay, wow, God's really blessed me. I'm going to sit back, eat, drink, and be merry for the rest of my days. He doesn't do that. He continually for his life continues to look forward to the city that has foundation, who is built by God. Verse 11 and 12, by faith even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, uh, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age since she was considered that the one, since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Therefore, from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead, came offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and as innumerable as the grain of the sand along the seashore. Sarah was willing to believe that the impossible could happen. I struggle with that. I I don't know about you, but there have been a lot of times when, when situations have arisen in my life or in the lives of those that I love and, and there's a maybe a medical situation going on or, or some difficult marriage situation going on, and I don't have the faith to pray for resolution. I don't have the faith to pray that God's going to fix this. I, shame on me. I, I'm not putting myself up as a positive example here in, in the least, but there are times when situations are so difficult and they're so uh, stressful or, or they're so uh, just confusing and mixed up and, and difficult to understand that I, I sit there and go, God, I don't, I don't know what you can do with this. I don't even know what to pray for. There are times when I, I don't have enough faith to believe that the impossible can happen. That doesn't mean I don't have enough faith to believe that God can make the impossible happen. I just just don't even know what the outcome should be. But I love that Sarah and Abraham, they believe. Abraham, while he might not have known exactly how God was going to accomplish this promise, he knew God would. He knew, you know, and they, Sarah offered Hagar, and, and they thought maybe that's the way God wants to do this because God had not given them all the details. Even when God finally said, no, it will be Sarah's child, they believed. It doesn't mean they didn't have occasional doubts. You've got the story of Sarah and Abram laughing. They both are, laugh at this whole thing. But ultimately, they believe the impossible can happen. To the point to where when later down the road and God asked Abram to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice, it says in Hebrews that Abram believed God's promises so strongly 
that he believed God would raise the child from the dead because God promised that that child would be the one to carry on the, the blessing. That's faith. That's faith. That's believing, creating the ability to see. And we need to be that way. It goes on in the next few verses, verse 13 down through 16, to say this. These all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they had an opportunity to, to return. But they now desire a better place a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Do you notice that? If we put our eyes on where we're from, if we put our eyes on what we can still see, if we put our eyes on what is tangible, what is earthly, what is, what is easy to, to wrap our minds around, then that's where we return. That if if that's where your hope is, that's where you put your action. But if you put your eyes on what is unseen, on, on what, what has been promised, on the things that we've not yet experienced, if your eyes are on what is still out there, then that's where you'll stay focused. That's where you'll put your action. That's where you'll really develop doing the things that God has asked us to do. And so the, what I want us to walk away with tonight is this idea that believing is seeing. We need to be that little boy in the movie shaking that bell so hard next to your ear going, I believe, I believe, I believe. But instead of a bell, maybe it needs to be the scriptures. Or instead of a bell, maybe it needs to be the promises of heaven. Instead of the bells, maybe it needs to be God's directions for how life should be lived, even when it doesn't make sense in our human mind. We need to be those who are willing to, to believe it. Because when it comes to life, to, to living in this world, we see something to believe it. But when it comes to faith, we believe something to see it. That, that needs to be the way we approach life. What is it Paul tells us? For we walk not, or we walk by faith and not by sight. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Starting in verse 6, it says, So we are, we are always confident. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. But we walk by faith, not by sight. In fact, we are confident, and we would, we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. I hope you can say that. My, my experience has been both in my own lives and in those that I talk to within the church, that, that very few of us can confidently say that. It gets a little easier the older you get. But this idea of, you know what? I would rather leave all of this behind so that I can be with the Lord. We struggle to say that and to believe it. We hold on to our lives with every ounce of strength that we have. We will fight to continue living. We will fight to, to have every experience we can have in this life. We will fight to have every, every pleasure this life has to offer. We do everything we can to get the most out of this world because that's what this world has told us we're supposed to do. And I love that, that Paul's response here is, no, no, no. Verse 9 whether we are away or at home, uh, we make it our aim to be pleasing to him. That, that's 
the goal. That's what it means to, to walk by faith, is that every aim, every, uh, every directive of life, every goal you have is set on pleasing him. I mentioned this morning you making plans for the new year. Can you honestly say that everything you wrote down, every thought you've had and what you want to accomplish in 2022 has actually been about pleasing him instead of pleasing yourself? That's a, that's a hard statement to make, isn't it? That doesn't mean that, that something can't be both pleasing to him and to us. Ideally, it should be both. But, but the goal, what we should do, what we should pursue is a pleasing of him because that's what it means to walk by faith. You know, when we, when we walk by faith, it changes the way we see the world. The world is no longer our home. It is a place where we are at to do work. That's it. It is a place where we come to labor. It's a place where we come to get the job done until we go back home. And Dallas was telling me just before services this evening uh, that, that back in the last blizzard that came through, I think he called it Snowmageddon, uh, that came through, he was at uh, Wanda's office painting a room, and they got snowed in at the office, and so they had to stay there for the night because of this snowstorm that came through. I can guarantee you, I didn't ask this, I can guarantee you they didn't rearrange the furniture that night because they thought it looked better. And I can guarantee you they didn't go on Amazon that night and shop for a new rug uh, to, to go in the living room, if a living room existed in that office. I mean, they didn't, they didn't come in for the night and move in. They didn't settle in. It wasn't where they belonged. They were there to get a job done they just happened to have to stay a little bit longer than they wanted. That didn't change the way they saw where they were. That's what we are in this world. We're here to do a job at a place of work until we get to go home. And that changes the way we see things. It changes the way we settle. It changes the... The, the perspective of what becomes important in everyday life. We need to be the kind of people who are truly willing to put our eyes on the goal and our eyes on heaven and, and let that be what we see every day. Not this. You know, when we recognize that, that we're here just looking for a city, that, that's all we're doing. We are here looking for what is still to come and doing the work we've been given while we're here, that changes the way we see our purpose. You know, my purpose is not to become rich. My purpose is not to become successful in the eyes of the world. My purpose is not to heap up a following after myself. My purpose is to get God's message into the eyes and ears and hearts of the world around me and to live it out so that they may see it in action. That's my purpose. Anything other than that can be a distraction. And, and that's what it means to walk by faith. I like this quote by Thomas Aquinas. To one who has faith, no ex explanation is necessary. To one without faith, no explanation is possible. And I like that quote because it helps us to see that when we view the world, when we view our, our thought process, when we, believe, when we view our belief system with faith, we're not sitting around looking for all the evidence to prove it true. I, I have cracked up over the years and, and probably been a little too harsh over the years as a teacher whenever I talk about apologetics and I say, well, why do we believe this? And some, some people just go, we believe just because we believe. And I'm like, well, that's not good enough. Actually, it is. That is good enough. Because for a person with faith, who walks by faith, they don't need an explanation. Because they believe it. And we need to be the kind of people who just believe it. 
I like to word it this way. Faith is not about how much we know or how far we can see, but trusting in who you know and what he says is before us. That's what believing is seeing is all about. It's about living a life where we just trust what he says. And remember what we read this morning in Isaiah chapter 44? Who among you can tell what's coming in the future? Can any of those idols tell you what's still to come? Let them announce it and we'll see. I, I don't know what tonight holds. We might get 20 inches of snow and we get the most fun next two days and then the most horrifying next two weeks ever. I mean, that, that could happen. I don't think so because James Spann said that's not going to happen, but th that could happen. God's the one who really knows. My whole family could die on the way home tonight in a horrific car accident. I could live till I'm 120. I don't know. I, I really don't know what this life holds. How much longer of this life I have, how much, how much money I'm going to die with, or how little money I'm going to die with. I, I don't know any of the details about the future here. Even though that, that's probably where I put the most amount of my attention. See, here's the ironic thing. The only future I'm actually sure about is the future there. Shouldn't I put my attention on that? If that's the one I really know about, if that's the one that I truly have confidence in, if it's that future that I can really hold on to, because it is sure, because my God has promised it, then that's the one I should be working on. And I hope we will. I hope we will live that kind of faith. It, it truly is a, a great thing to have a God who, who loves us so much that he's willing to give us those kind of guarantees and those kind of rewards. And let me remind you again, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please God, but he who believes in him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. If I truly want to have a relationship with God, if I believe that he is, then I must be an active seeker because he is an active rewarder. And that relationship between us uh, that he is rewarding me and I am seeking him and, and every day I'm trying to draw closer to him and, and every day I'm getting closer to my reward. That's the way the relationship works. And all that begins with being baptized into Christ. If, if you've not made that decision, that's the decision on the table in front of you. That's the decision you need to be wrestling with and thinking about and praying about and that's the decision we want you to make tonight, if you're ready. For many of us, we know Jesus. We know our Father.